No, I'm just, uh, this, this is a reminder because, okay, let's get, let's take our seats again and resume. We have a very interesting session coming up. Uh, throughout this forum, we've talked about uh, different ways of uh, encouraging innovation and encouraging uh, citizen involvement. Uh, we've also been talking about, well, how do we institutionalize? I think yesterday we talked about sustainability and what was it that would uh, foster sustainability of the solutions we do come up with. Uh, yesterday morning we took a quick look at the Open Data Institute in the United Kingdom. Uh, today we're uh, pleased to welcome uh, two additions to our forum. Uh, Sir Nigel Shadbolt uh, was the founder of ODI and will uh, lead us off and talk in a little bit more detail about ODI and its potential analog in the United States. And also Nick Sinai from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, who will uh, also have a few remarks afterwards. So let's okay. go ahead. Thanks very much. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. Um, actually, it's a little bit of a double act here, Gavin and I. I know Gavin has been talking about the ODI a little bit. Um, what we wanted to say, uh, I, Part of this, our reflections about where we are, are based on our trying to understand what has and hasn't worked in our own parish in the UK. And also then, the amount of inbound interest we've had in this has made us think, what are the bits and processes and things we have learned that, that we might want to kind of put out there and discuss with, uh, with colleagues around the world? And in this context, of course, most especially uh, the US context. So the the ODI uh, was uh, initially set up with, with, with public money. Uh, we have uh, um, an obligation to match that um, 10 million pounds or 15 million dollars of funding with, uh, with private money over the course of the five years and indeed to become a sustainable um, institution going forward. We are not a part of government, okay? We have no board representation from government, no board members. We're a, a company limited by guarantee. We're a not-for-profit, but uh, um, uh, we clearly have a position uh, where we are able to talk seriously to the administration in the UK. Uh, we have um, various kind of conversations and uh, representations on key boards within the UK. So it's not as if we are entirely disinterested. And, and our function is to um, catalyze really uh, the evolution of an open data culture. And I think those are, that's a really important way to think about our process. We don't have enough money, nothing like enough to kind of change the landscape, but we can use our capability literally as a, as a catalyst at appropriate moments to really multiply the effects that are there. Uh, and we talk about it in this triple bottom line way, economic, environment, and social value creation. Value creation. But to be clear, we were initially uh, uh, instigated with the notion that growth, economic growth, would be a very powerful stimulus for the open data movement. Actually, I believe that to be the case, that if you don't have a very strong demand side that is coming from uh, business as well as uh, civic forums, uh, you may well see the supply side wither or indeed never get good enough uh, to be sustainable. So what we're doing to kind of promote that is essentially um, a range of activities in the UK, uh, essentially to build capacity, to examine standards in this area for open data, um, fostering startups, and we'll uh, uh, look at a couple of examples there. So we're, we're obliged, we have a number of key performance indicators over the duration, uh, this initial duration of setup, where we've got to take businesses in build them, grow them, and show and demonstrate that these people are using open da data assets to generate uh, the value, economic value. Um, we've got to build structured evidence, uh, build some inspiring stories, host events, so the reach out to the wider community, again, a uh, core part of what we're doing, um, and engaging with both corporates and uh, the public sector to explain the process to us, it's all very, very close in. It's still a remarkably 
um, challenging concept to many out there that this, um, this process of simply making available um, data in this way could be as disruptive as we know it will be. So the impact analysis, beginning to gather the evidence, uh, is actually uh, an interesting feature of our work. And the final piece is all around training and capability building, making sure that we are both at a policy level and a technology level able to, uh, to uh, get people capable of delivering this. Now, this, uh, I think Gavin mentioned this yesterday, this is an example of some work one of our startups that uh, is, is, is uh, in residence at the ODI. Chris Taggart's Open Corporate, uh, a really interesting piece of work, which actually, I would argue, has both a really strong economic message and a very strong governance and accountability principle. It's one of those great examples where you can look at it and say, this is holding people accountable, actually in just the same way that the recent G8 claims around tax and transparency were claiming we needed to happen. This is work which uh, is now live where significant, very, very significant open data assets have been used to build a beneficial ownership, a corporate holdings map. And in fact, um, this one here, of course, is, uh, you will now recognize by now probably the, the overinflated outline of the Cayman Islands, uh, Mauritius and uh, Luxembourg in this case, I believe, where actually if you look at what companies are held where and co-owned and uh, um, uh, full subsidiaries of what companies, you build this exquisite and detailed map of um, corporate um, uh, insight, corporate intelligence, one would say. Now, it is Chris's and open, open Corporate's contention that this is both important and very disruptive. They, will, they are developing business models off the back of this in terms of analytics, service level agreements, uh, that are going to be very disruptive to some of the incumbents in this uh, world. Uh, and uh, that's what, of course, the market is all about, and we're keen to promote it. But um, what we are wanting to do in this case is, is highlight examples, develop businesses that show powerful adoption and usage of open data. So we're in a context where we've got a unique moment. I think Gavin referred to this yesterday. We, we know there's global demand. We've had many uh, uh, countries uh, uh, coming and talking to us about how the ODI is doing what it's doing. Um, we've been developing a range of instruments. The interesting thing is that I would like to have the conversation be very much framed around, well, what have we understood for ourselves? Actually, as we try to formalize those things that have worked, we've tried to turn the ODI inside out um, and eat our own dog food, be open. So what are the ways in which we can instrument ourselves to understand how well we're doing, where we're receiving our funds, uh, what impact we're having in the world, who we're working with, what are the tools and standards we're adopting. And, uh, and this is something that I think we'd like to share with you in the, in, in the next phase. So I'm, I'm going to kind of turn over to, uh, to, to Gavin now to take us a little bit further on that. I think the really interesting question is that in trying to understand what would work in taking this model further, there are some really interesting opportunities and they're very different ways of going about this. Thank you, Nigel. So we've been asking the question, or rather we've been asked the question many times uh, by, diff by different countries, what, what do they do in their own uh, jurisdiction? How do they build on this growing movement around open data? And we've looked at whether or not we should take a more traditional federated approach or have some kind of loose brand coalition or a top-down kind of single organization or a network approach. And really, these are questions um, we're trying to look at. Given the nature of this as a global opportunity, how can we be very agile and, and keep in front of the wave, if you like, and, and make sure that we capitalize on impact and sustainability? But th these are quite often in conflict with each other. There are different benefits to different models. So these are the kind of questions we've been asking. We, we want to open that set of questions up uh, much more broadly into an international conversation. Uh, we've looked at commercial models that have transitioned, so going from more broadcast networks to group forming networks or peer-to-peer -peer networks, and we see strong evolution and good examples there to, to learn from. Uh, we see changes in civic society um, who can use self-organizing uh, groups. And I think 
it's kind of very much in my DNA, and certainly Nigel and, and Tim's DNA, to, it's quite hard for us to think of anything other than a distributed network. So uh, in trying to ask these questions, we ha have had to force ourselves to go back and say, well, what is the right kind of model here that would help to catalyze this evolution of open data <laughs> culture? Um, one of the examples I've looked at, uh, I've looked at a uh, range of organizations from Save the Children to Medicine Sans Frontier, et cetera. Human Rights Watch, to me, was quite an interesting example because it has taken a, or is taking a huge amount of capital to try and create a, a global network there. And I think when I think about the potential of the web and the potential of distributed networks, can we create $100 million worth of value, $100 million worth of impact for a tenth of the amount of cost? So if we were to spend, take a $10 million investment, could we turn it into $100 million worth of value? Because that's kind of the typical dynamic you, you find with a lot of uh, web tech. So our vision, and it's, it's an evolving conversation, um, is anchored around many parts loosely joined. How do we build an agile, multi-node, distributed network to help catalyze open data culture. We need to do a few things in, in the creation of a, of a network here. And I'd say, as I said yesterday, this is not an export model. It's not something that we're trying to sort of push out. It's very much how do we catalyze a network. What we've done is tried to codify what we've been doing over the last nine months into an ODI charter. Uh, we'd like to create a framework which enables people to act, to, to get on board, to be the flag bearer for open data. There are lots of other open data initiatives out there. We need to interact with, partner with, uh, team up with on, on a whole range of levels, whether that's uh, Code for America, Open Knowledge Foundation, Sunlight Foundation. There are you know incredible work being done already, but how can we amplify this? And one of the things we found is helping to amplify the work of some of those groups already has led to different types of interaction. We've reached new communities, we've reached broader networks. So how can we amplify and replicate a model and create more connected impact? So what we've done is we've, we've started to codify what we've been doing in, in an ODI charter. Uh, this comprises our own mission and values, our governance and team support, our operational procedures, our own open data standards, and these are building on other standards as well, the Open Knowledge uh, Foundation, the, the open definition itself. Um, our brand and communication, so we're codifying the organization as a whole. Uh, this is all on GitHub today. Um, I've just updated it uh, this morning, uh, and we're really keen to have a conversation around this. Um, and what do we mean by open by default? Well, it's not just the technology. It's our investor metrics. It's our business plan. It's our finances. It's our day-to-day -day project plans. So as we evolve, uh, we'll be publishing everything that we're actually doing and our performance against those metrics. So as Nigel said, trying to embody uh, being an open organization. So these kind of dashboards here around how far are we through our objectives that we've set, what is our income, how much revenue have we booked, how many people have we reached, but also our investor metrics. So there's specific investor metrics here that we've worked with the UK investors and with Omidyar. And as you can see, we're pretty delighted that on the uh, right-hand side, we're outperforming on, on the vast majority of them already. But all of this just indicates that there's a huge amount of momentum in the system, and how do we capitalize on that? So one of the things that we have as an idea is how do we help ca catalyze this open network? One of the elements is to get out of the way quickly, but enable people to build on the work that the network is doing. So if we created a three-level structure, one which is simple, uh, level one, uh, which is a brand license that enables any organization to join for free and just be part of the, the flag bearing group. Uh, a second level which enables people to do local fundraising and attract local members and then building up to a level three uh, network which could be a country lead. And I classify ODI London then as a level three node. So we don't see ourselves as being the center of this network at all. There will be a natural point where you know, if we end up with, uh, between now and getting to say five country leads, the UK will have to be, if you like, the, the root node. But as soon as we get to say five nodes, then we create a global governance board and restructure uh, a global network at that point. So there's a mechanism here of, of engaging fast, enabling people to fail fast, uh, creating a three to four month window to allow people to start. And then how can we 
um, extend that from a country perspective. So we've already had interest from Indonesia, from Japan, from Sweden, from Australia, and from the US. And maybe there's a country lead ready to go in each of these uh, territories. Um, there may be specialists in each of those areas. But if we look at a grand challenge uh, or a, a specific challenge approach, how do we start bringing together different parts of this network? Because I keep coming back to the fact that while we're all very passionate about what we're doing, there are still a very small number of us worldwide working on open data, on open governance, on the whole spectrum of open initiatives. We need to increase the number of people engaged in this space by orders of magnitude. So by enabling any organization to engage, we can start to build a network, whether they're a small two-person startup or whether they're a much larger NGO. Linked with this, I think one of the best ways of catalyzing and, and bringing people together around an issue is to create a grand challenge. So what is the X prize for open data? Um, how can we use the power of a global network to tackle global issues around fi finance, energy, climate, health, other issues? And how can we unlock global funding? I've heard over the last nine months, very much listening mode to philanthropic investors looking for more metrics-driven impact. I've also listened to venture capitalists coming to the table and saying, we're really interested in this space, but we also want to create some kind of social value. So there is a coincidence of desires, if you like, around channeling funds to really well-coordinated specific initiatives that have global reach. So how can we blend public, philanthropic, and commercial funding? And then if there's a local node, they can opt in to a grand challenge, and we can start to unlock that funding. So again, one other idea, and these are all just ideas I'm putting on the table for completely open discussion. Maybe there's a national challenge fund. Maybe we could set a, a million dollar prize for setting up lead in institutions. Who's got the strongest team? Who can get committed fundraising of a million dollars? Who can create the right partnerships and give uh, funding directly to uh, local initiatives that address local issues but that are part of a global network? And I've put a stake in the ground. A $10 million fund would help us achieve this at scale. So these are all broad ideas. Uh, we've got somewhere to begin the conversation, uh, and we're really keen to just open it out from this point. And so what we thought would be, Nick, if you could uh, respond uh, and at least uh, sort of senior level of the, the US, but then I want to uh, expand it out and have uh, us have a discussion of, you know, what would be useful to you who are the makers and the builders and the uh, actors uh, and, you know, to your communities, uh, you know, all a day and a half we've been talking about, let's look at the product, let's look at the end result, what, you know, what are we going to come out with? How will this concept of this open data network um, help us achieve our goals? Nick? Great, thank you. Let me just start with a little bit of context to know I know a lot of you, and a lot of you may, may know this, uh, but, but we continue to uh, expand our, our open data work across the federal government. And so um, there's great work that started from day one of the administration, but really over the last, last few years, it's continued to, continued to expand. And uh, uh, under the leadership of Todd Park, my boss, uh, and the president, we've established six flagship uh, uh, data initiatives, open data initiatives, they're really vertically focused. And I think that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about is the horizontal versus uh, 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 vertical focus. Uh, so in energy, education, public safety, global development, finance, um, we've established these open data initiatives that are thinking about uh, healthcare transformation, for example, and how data technology and innovation with open data being a open government data and, and other open data is a significant piece of that. Uh, and those have started from, from very small workshops and data jams and meetups uh, to, to actually large, uh, multi-day, several thousand people data paloozas. And it's great when you have White House officials talking about data jams and data paloozas and putting those in, in White House uh, uh, press releases. So we know that we're making some good progress here. Uh, uh, the President recognizes just, just how important open data is to fueling private sector innovation. And uh, um, while we talk about GPS and weather data a lot, uh, in fact, there, there, are, there are lots of great examples of companies today 
uh, that are growing and adding jobs. And so just this Monday, uh, the president, in kicking off a second term management agenda, that is how can we create a smarter, better, faster, cheaper government, uh, how, can we, how can we improve government, uh, talked about open data considerably. And he pointed out two, two companies, uh, uh, Opower, which uses uh, uh, energy data um, and weather data and other, other uh, pieces of government data um, that has several, several hundred jobs and is growing, growing quickly. He pointed out the company of iTriage as well. And in fact, there were, there were many other uh, examples that we could have, uh, 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 the, the President could have, could have talked about. Um, and so if, if I can just speak personally here, I, I absolutely think um, that, that there is an opportunity to, to uh, create an open data institute in the U.S. Um, and whether uh, that is a network of a node, which I think is a really interesting idea, uh, whether it's, it's uh, um, ho however the, the uh, affiliation and branding and relationship, I think that's something that I welcome this, this conversation. Uh, but, but my hypothesis is that there is, there is room for something that is vertical, I mean, excuse me, something that is horizontal. And in the vertical spaces, we have, we have something like the Health Data Consortium, which does a great job of partnering with the federal government, uh, um, uh, helping to coordinate the, uh, um, the funder interest, the corporate interest, entrepreneurs, uh, um, the meetups, doing things that, that government can't do, celebrating uh, um, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and really working with us uh, to be greater than the than, than what government can do. I think there is an opportunity to, to, to establish uh, an open data institute that um, is a little bit different from uh, Sunlight. I think Sunlight and CFA and Open Knowledge are all fantastic organizations and have great roles. Uh, but uh, um, I think there is an opportunity, something that is, is uh, and so I just kind of chatted down a couple ideas. Um, one was celebrate and convene. Two was resources, tools, and people. The third one was organize and harness uh, corporate and funder interest, especially around prizes and challenges. And then the fourth would be around uh, neutral convening around, around data standards. And just to go back to the, to the first one around celebrating and convening, um, I think there, there really is an opportunity to, to celebrate uh, not just two entrepreneurs that the president can say in a speech, but the hundreds and thousands of entrepreneurs that are today creating products and services. And I think that's important actually to get away from the app conversation because we often kind of uh, uh, look at the 10% the of open data that is around apps when, when really it's about uh, uh, a whole range of products and services, some of that are delivered by people, but they're powered by open government data. And so uh, there is an opportunity to uh, uh, celebrate the hundreds and thousands of, of entrepreneurs to partner in these vertical areas, um, to, to partner with the accelerators, the learn to code platforms, et cetera, uh, and to celebrate government people as well. And while we have a, a role to kind of keep them accountable, and accountability organizations are important uh, to call us out when we're, when we're uh, not making things sufficiently open and machine readable, and we're really excited about the president's executive order and the new default being open and machine readable, uh, uh, there's also an opportunity to celebrate uh, both federal employees and, and of course, local uh, government employees, because I think uh, we have to think about incentives and, and carrots, um, and so uh, celebrating that kind of um, opening of data to solve real <coughs> problems, right? It's not open data for open data's sake, as, as everyone talks about, but it is in the, in the context of fueling private sector innovation, in the context of improving government efficiency, and in the context of accountability and transparency. Uh, around all three of those those uh, uh, opportunities to to celebrate uh, um, uh, government folks around the resources tools and people uh, uh, um, I don't know that a, a US open data Institute uh, needs to be an incubator or accelerator we have lots of those uh, um, but I'm open to the idea and I think it's it's really interesting um, but certainly uh, in government there's a lot of discussion about what's possible but what really crystallizes it is a prototype or a minimum viable product. And there's not enough people in government uh, uh, that can create a minimum viable product over the course of a weekend um, and, and uh, um, make that the basis of the discussion about why it's valuable to, to open the data. And so whether that's micro grants for prototypes or, or, or minimum viable products or whether that, that's 
people at an open data institute. I think that's a kind of a valuable uh, 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 function. Um, as many of you know, and we have a couple uh, esteemed graduates of the Presidential Innovation Fellow uh, Program. Um, there is a, <laughs> esteemed is not the right word, uh, troublemakers perhaps in the best possible of sense. Uh, people are critically important here. And so I think, I think in any conversation about, about uh, capacity building, uh, um, how, do, how do we increase the velocity of, of, of people uh, who are, are thinking about op open data uh, inside the federal government? And I apologize for being very provincial here. I'm talking about an open data institute and, and how uh, an administration, uh, Democrat or Republican, could partner. Um, uh, so this is, this is something that I would, I would hope would be uh, longstanding. Um, because there are other opportunities in, in the, both in the, in the uh, uh, local government as well and, and certainly around the, the corporate side. But just speaking very provincially, there's an opportunity to really accelerate uh, open data efforts uh, across federal government. And I, th and I think that there's, there's a, uh, it's worth a, a conversation here about what a model could look like and certainly how it could be uh, affiliated or, or part of a, a larger network. Good. Well, let's turn to our presidential innovator, Clay Johnson. Um, I, I think this is cool stuff. Um, I think, um, I think it's, there's, there's a necessity here. What's interesting is, after seeing this presentation, um, you know, I had, I had conceptions of what ODI did before your presentation, and now I have a, a more informed uh, conception, which I, I hope was, was your point. Um, uh, what's interesting about what ODI is doing, it seems to me, and this is just sort of a quick question for you guys, uh, is you guys aren't exclusively focused on opening government data. You're, you're focused on opening data. And I think that that's an important note. And, and Nick, you know, I, I get what's exciting to you is that an open data institute in the United States would help to open government data. But I think what makes it sort of, makes an ODI in the United States viable um, is its broader focus beyond what government is able to, um, to do. I mean, it seems to me like the extent of your relationship with government is you got a grant from government, it's a matching grant, you're not gonna have that money for forever. Um, and then at that point, you guys will hopefully be a sustained organization. Um, there is a, there is a, uh, I, th I, th I think what's, what's, it, what's, I think where I'm getting a little hung up is that there, I, I see the need for two organizations um, and one is one that's focused on helping government um, use technology better and being sort of a coach to government on how to do stuff better. And the other one is an ODI for the United States. Um, I think that, th that a common theme throughout today has, uh, and throughout all of yesterday uh, was uh, about education of, of, of employees inside of the government and, and keeping people smart and keeping people uh, focused and rewarding good talent. Um, but I don't think that that would be something that you would get from an ODI, at least in its, in its present form in the United States. Um, I think you, and I don't think you'd want that. I think you'd want um, an ODI to be focused on opening data and encouraging the, the openness of data, but not like here's how to get an app for cheap or here's how to do the right kind of procurement or that kind of thing. So that's, that's my two cents. Okay, Ellen. Um. I actually want to respond to, to Nick because Nigel and uh, Gavin and I have talked a lot about uh, what ODI would do versus what's already being done in the U.S. Sunlight among one of the groups that's, that's doing a lot of it. But a lot, Nick, of what you're suggesting, people are already doing. Um, celebrating entrepreneurs. You know, we, for example, have an Open Government Champs program where we talk about entrepreneurs all around the country, providing resources tools, making it easy f to, for people to use government data, um, <laughs> neutral convening around standards, particularly around open government standards, has been going on in the U.S. since 2007, actually uh, around the world since 2007, and there's been a tremendous amount of work that's been done around that. Micro grants, we've been doing that, you know, since our founding. So 
The things that you're suggesting, I think, are already in play by a number of U.S. groups, but I think, I think one of the strong advantages of ODI is the sort of buzz that has, has, has been generated by the founding of ODI um, in terms of gathering substantial new resources to this field. So we're one of the biggest organizations, and our budget is uh, already less than ODIs, and, and, and there's not enough to, to take what we're doing in sort of each of these areas I just described, or our community's uh, budget, and s really scale it. You know, we have, you know, five or uh, two or three people on our municipal team. If you had 20 people working with municipal governments, you could do, you know, 20 times as much. So I think, I think one value for ODI in the U.S. and globally is uh, that this is going to be a big global push. And to the degree we can raise uh, together uh, more money, um, and I caution government funding in this arena. I caution it strongly. I think it's compromising, at least in the U.S. culture. I, I'm certain it's compromising. Um, but I think that's one certain, uh, certain um, uh, advantage that ODI has. But some of the specifics, Nick, that, that you listed, I think, are, are not where I see the gaps. I mean, we've talked about movement. Uh, uh, I mean, we're, we're moving, I think we're seeing that there's this movement that's global and that can be encouraged. And I think the question for us as we go around is, how can we most encourage the institutions in the United States, because you're working on it in, in other countries, and you know we could think even more globally. Um, how can we, uh, you know, encourage organizations and people in the U.S. to join the movement, enhance the movement, spur, uh, and become part of this worldwide network? Max Ogden was next. So I really do believe that open data is a chicken egg problem, but once you achieve the right level of network effects, then uh, the avalanche has started, or the snowball has started to roll. Um, so I worked, during my Code for America fellowship, I worked with Nike, um, they're based in Portland where I'm from, and Ward Cunningham, who invented the wiki, was a mentor of mine, and he actually worked for Nike, and uh, they, it was really important that um, he come in from the outside and tried to look at their sustainable apparel and sustainable materials data, and he, he wanted them to share it publicly using open data. So what he did was, Nike sits on a board of all the other companies that buy large amounts of cotton and other things. And he actually invented a new wiki um, just for materials that they use. And the goal was um, Nike doesn't know how, what other companies put into their, their products. They don't know where they're buying them or the percentages or the wages for the workers or the energy usage or the water usage or anything. So if the industry was able to share its data, the idea was that um, industry-wide decisions, supply chain decisions could become more efficient and um, companies could work together to kind of more sustainably rapidize their operations. Um, and that was met with um, praise from the Sustainable Coalition, but the uptake in other companies hasn't been as big yet. And I think that's because it's left up to the people at Nike and the people at the other companies to kind of do it amongst themselves. There's no clear organization that can provide political support um, to an effort like this, but I think it's an incredibly important effort, and we had really smart technical people on the problem, and we had buy-in from at least one of the companies, but there just wasn't the, there wasn't any organization that owned that, that was publicly recognized, that had the network of people to provide external support. Um, I think that if something like the Open Data Institute had a, uh, existed a couple years ago, we could go to them and say, hey, we want to get a bunch of articles written about this, we want to do a documentary about how this is important, we want to go to the factories and show that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If there was a group that just focused on selling the human side of the story, I think it'd be super huge. And I can say that Code for America doesn't do, that's not their job, that's a side effect of their job, but that's not the one thing that they do. And equivalently with Open Knowledge Foundation and Sunlight, it's, they do other things, they also develop technology. I think that the thing about Open Data Institute that I like is that it's just about achieving the network effect and making it an all-encompassing all buy-in kind of thing. Good. Katria. I'm going to be kind of the dark cloud. Um, I wonder about the share-alike um, part of the program um, and relating it to the problem that uh, Max was talking about, the chicken and egg. It would really be 
forcing startups using open data to this organization, which is great, but there isn't that much support for that in the venture capital world right now um, that we've seen. When you say proprietary data source, um, their, their eyes light up, and it's like Christmas for venture capital. Um, if you say proprietary data source combined with open data, it'd actually be useful, but it's no longer proprietary. That, that kind of, I think there's work to be done that definitely your organization and, and United States organizations can do educating people about, about how open data works with um, other data sets, right? Um, and I think targeting some of that education to the people who fund companies, small companies, um, and then also larger corporations that might not want to use your data for the same reason uh, would be well placed. Okay. I'll go. Yeah. Um, observation as an external observer, so not from the United States, not from the UK. So I think if I was, if a hypothetical situation, somebody asked, do you want to fund an ODI in Brazil? I would think it's an excellent idea. But then the second calculation that I'll do would be opportunity costs. To fund that, we're not going to print money. Those resources that go to funding this could go somewhere else. The question that I would be asking myself in the case of Brazil would be, would I get a better return of investment in creating an ODI in Brazil or by putting that money in existing networks and communities? So I think this is the question that I would be making. Maybe it should be made here as well. Okay, John. So first let me say, Charlie, that you're very fortunate to be able to have this group together. Um, having attended so many tables where all of us are basically edge dwellers, but very few of us are edge builders. And what you have here is an ensemble of edge builders which can go beyond just talk, which is, of course, incredibly exciting. ODI. And one of the things that really strikes me is you are in institutional innovation to drive institutional innovations more broadly. Now, what are you trying to achieve through the institutional innovations in other institutions that you care about? I think it's easy to buy into many of the things you say. I mean, it's easy to buy into everything you say. But the thing that keeps hitting me at times is so many of our governments, city, state, country, so many of our large-scale corporations have been organized toward optimal efficiency, or scalable efficiency, however you wish to look at that. Um, they are rigid organizations. We're now living in a world where agility is simply the coin of the realm. I like to think about how do we create a set of new types of institutional drivers that understand how to bring a sense of agility to the city, to the state, to large-scale corporations? How do we find new ways to bring the outside of a, of a corporation, I mean the core of a corporation, out and the out somewhat more in? And the more I've been listening to all the conversations here, one of the biggest lever points we have is open data. It's open data because if you have open data, then there are all, for all kinds of forms of bringing in agility at the last moment in new ways, network effects, and so on and so forth. So I'm kind of curious that if I had to go out and raise a hell of a lot of money, I might also point out that around this table you have a new mechanism of agility. And if we can't solve the agility problem, we're dead in the water. And so you may have something here substantially more powerful than just amplifying engagement. You may really be become the drivers for new organizational architectures for the 21st century. And I think we all kind of intuit that, but I think it's worth kind of putting it on the table because you may be after a bigger game implicitly than you realize. And I think understanding that it actually brings in very interesting art questions of how do you actually take something on the edge that helps to drive change inside and change outside as well. So I go to Chicago and this summer you have, I think it's called Summer in Chicago, um, where 
for example, <coughs> OBI, Mozilla's open badge system, uh, is an attempt to actually find ways that school kids can leverage all the resources in the city uh, in terms of museums, et cetera, et cetera, but be able to bring some of those experiences into the school system, which is incredibly resistant to change. <laughs> and so you already see kind of an experiment to bring the outside in through a new type of, o of open data, something as simple as an OBI. And I just think that the power here is much greater than we realize, and I think we need potentially other kinds of narratives as well as complementary narratives to push what the big game here might be, uh, my sense of listening. So I think that's a very good question to get us some perspective on, you know, just how important this movement is, um, this resource is, and uh, I don't know, maybe take a second if uh, Gavin or Nigel want to yeah, respond. Yeah, I mean, just, just, just to talk to John's point there, I, 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 think, I think the really almost exhilarating experience of the last few years has been to see that if if we are serious about this, it is institutionally transformative. It sounds very, ch you hear this kind of thing bandied about, but actually the way that one can begin to use an instrument yourself to both use open data and, and live by its credo and still generate value uh, very substantially, as far as we can see, is, is, is really quite, uh, so, so that's, that's why we're about it. And again, this, the convening of these people is, is exciting in that regard. I think, uh, I think, I think it's really salutary. Actually, Katya made some uh, really interesting observation. It, it's, it's, it's how, how good a job will be done in convincing the corporate world that there is, uh, there is real, real value or more to be had by possibly getting off their backsides and releasing some of the data they kind of can't bear to think about giving out because it might just have some value to someone else. But actually, we've begun to see uh, a number of big corporates in the UK who come to us and say, we do not have the R&D ca capability to do anything with this, okay? It's got to be better for us to try and see whether there can be somebody else. Th there's, there's a sense that open innovation, that other people might actually do more on your data than you can, and you will benefit. Um, but there are many stories like this, and the, the Nike example is a very good one. I mean, the, the, the supply chain, the valuation there, there are more companies starting to wake up to the thought that actually this is possibly quite a powerful enabler a way to regain rather shabby trust in some areas too. So, but I agree entirely that um, it's still a bit of a mystery to um, some of the hard Asian investors to understand how can free, how can open make money. Um, but we know there are about eight basic business models around it. It's not as if this is uh, unknown. Pardon me, let me just say, it's not just making money I'm trying to drive at. No, I know. Big companies uh, and small companies, including healthcare, that agility yeah. is the game, not just making money. And efficiency, yeah. and agility, all those yeah. things. Yeah. I, I think, I, you know, thank you for articulating a lot of what we're trying to communicate much better than I just did. So um, I, I want to come back to Katria's point as well. We do VCs that they see value in open data. And in fact, one of the startups at the ODI has just raised about $400,000 from a, a venture capital uh, investor to take their business forward. Open Corporates, uh, for example, has customers, paying customers, including PwC. So the, the, the kind of new normal of open data will also bring, in the same way that the web has brought huge disruption as well as it's brought innovation, open data will bring huge disruption to the information industries. So the idea of closed data sets my belief is that over time they will become less valuable because the power of the networked information will be orders of magnitude greater value. So I, I think we'll see a shift and we have had some VCs come to us and say they have actually exited companies for a multiple based on the fact that they had an open data strategy. So it's kind of interesting shifting uh, sands. Just uh, really quickly, yeah. I think I think as, as an organization you can comfort small companies that mm -hmm. want to start yeah. and, and tell them that. And that will have much more of a th an effect than saying open data is awesome. It's going to actually get people to enter the field. Yeah, we also comfort the investors. Yes. So uh, that, that is a double-sided uh, coin. I think um, on the 
fund existing networks versus uh, funding a new organization. I think this is one of the reasons why I kind of arrived back at a, well, what's the lowest barrier to entry we could create? So a one-page MOU that licenses a brand and lets people join a network that you can do in 10 minutes has no cost. And if things then come from that where you can say, well, actually, I found a commercial member or some philanthropic funding or I got a whole bunch of Bitcoins or a Kickstarter campaign or wherever the funding comes from to help take that forward, it will be based on a local challenge and, and those local conditions that we will not know. Yeah, just very quickly on that. It's also because you guys have a, I'm thinking of the Brazil uh, hypothetical cases. Since you guys have a global mission, I would maybe think, well, maybe it's smarter to work with ODI than funding a second ODI here because otherwise I'll be somehow dub doubling your work because you have a global group. I think this comes back to my, my earlier point of while there's a huge kind of building uh, momentum and movement around uh, this area, that we are still a tiny, very large ocean. Uh, we're going to get orders of magnitude more people engaged in building out open data initiatives around the world. And what you've done is you've got your three stages. So you've got the membership, you've got the just a, a license, uh, you've got your membership, and then you know the actual full fledged. So uh, I think it'd be useful. For membership? Hmm? What do people get in return for membership? And what do the companies get in return for membership in ODI? So uh, from a, from a, an initial point, I think just we just are interested in as part of this is a response to questions we've been asked. Um, can we be a catalyst to a global network? Right, so that, that's the first point. Just no, but like Rackspace, you said yesterday that Rackspace ah. pays you dues. Yes. Right, so what does Rackspace pay? Oh, right, I that? see, right. So um, let, me, let me pick Virgin Media, maybe a better example. So Virgin Media have a huge data warehouse of effectively all the DNS records in, in the UK, all the, all the web traffic information. Um, they're working with us to uh, help anonymize that information. They want to release it as open data, and it's very much, to Nigel's point, is they have this gold mine that no miners. So how can we connect large organizations to innovators? And equally, how can we connect the innovators to the large organizations? And this is the common thread that we've seen with enterprise level organizations is they go, well, we, we know there's some value here, but we don't know how to find it. Do you, do you have any like qualifications for the companies? Like, do you have an ethical qualification? Like, would you work with, would you allow for, you know, uh, Lockheed Martin to be or a, or a tobacco company to engage with ODI, could they pay you dues and, and that's work with that's you? a great question. I think you know, when we first started, we were quite careful. We had a lot of interest. Uh, you know, dozens of organisations were interested in joining. I think we've been quite careful in working with organisations that are not just going to pay us money and go away. Right. They have to bring come with data right now. At but least if, it, but it if they came with like we also sell cigarettes to kids, would you still work with them? And, and I'm not trying to indict. No, you no. I, I think maybe a better example would be somebody who's really data mining. Uh, you know, sort of using the information than just sort of some. Uh, you know, what their product is. I, gu I guess where I'm getting at, is, and it's more to Ellen's point, right? Which is, I don't see the Sunlight Foundation coaching no. um, Altria on how to open data, right? I don't think that the Sunlight Foundation would ever do that. But I feel like ODI would. Well, we, um, we, I think that's a really great question. To, to be honest, I don't know. The guiding principles that we have here are we have a triple bottom line approach. So what's the economic value, what's the environmental value, and what's the social value? And as we encounter those challenges, you know, we can assess you know, what is the outcome from this p piece of work. So every member that we've signed so far has a project that they've brought with them that has to do with open data. And the outcomes of those projects are more open data that can address an issue. It could be finance, it could be social benefit, and it could be environmental. So okay. I think if we refine our direction as we try and navigate through that, we will work it out. So Ellen, more to your point, it seems to me like they, they do a lot of stuff that Sunlight would never do. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to Tony Shukar. And I'm still kind of, I would love to hear Nick's response to, to Ellen's statement and, and also the public is the pergs what like what gaps do you what do you think is already filled that ODI is trying to do in the US and what gaps from a government not a private sector perspective yeah. are there and I'm curious also from Gavin and Nigel yeah. how that what were the UK's versions of the pergs and the and the sunlights and how they're not replicating those efforts so I, I think there's an important role for uh, celebrating for-profit companies that are using open data as their input may not, in fact, be providing open data as their output. And 
someone who is, I was a VC for almost five years, companies that, that would come to us and say, you know, we have proprietary data and we're crowdsourcing or finding other ways to get, get other kind of uh, data exhaust and we're using open government data and we're putting together in our proprietary algorithm and we're delivering a product or service that is helping people in, in tangible ways and people are, or, or, or enterprises are paying for that and we're building a sustainable, by sustainable I mean something that, that's growing and, and making a lot of money, that's fantastic, it's adding jobs and GDP. And that's the kind of thing to celebrate and to work with, with government to celebrate and that, that doesn't feel like what Sunlight does. Yeah, so we, don't, we don't focus on the, uh, on the private sector success stories. Yes, we yes. And so I think there's a, r there's a real... Only the non, the non not, not only, but we, our community is more in the NGO sector. Yes, and so I think there's, uh, the, the part that the, that the president emphasi emphasizes is, is fuel for private sector innovation. And that private sector innovation can be open, but it can also be closed with open data as the input. And I think that's, that's actually one of the really interesting things about the, the Open Data Institute is, is a, uh, um, not only are they focusing on opening government data, but also opening corporate data. And that works for some corporations, uh, especially those that are embracing open innovation models. Um, but they're not opening everything, and, and certainly a lot of their, their secret sauce, they're never going to open. Um, so I think there's a, there's, there is a real opportunity. And, we, and quite frankly, you know, we need to capacity build as we think about opening US government data. We're just, we're just kind of at the, at the seams here. Of, uh, you know, we, we're, we're working really hard um, on, say, take these, these flagship areas, uh, but the opportunity to, to um, uh, bring in uh, corporate interest uh, um, that may have closed business models, that are interested in healthcare transformation, uh, the, uh, the clean energy transformation, uh, and they're not uh, open data focused, but they want to use valuable, uh, I mean, we have, we have massive amounts of, of data that is not sufficiently machine readable or findable or accessible or reliable enough, described well enough, uh, what have you, that can, that can be fuel for, for uh, I mean, we can't get to, uh, in health energy education, we're all going from volume to value, right? The incentives are starting to change in a pretty profound way. And government is a, a significant regulator or actor or player in all of those, uh, those, those markets. And so open data is going to be fuel and data tech and innovation is gonna be uh, necessary to get to places where we're paying people for uh, uh, value instead of volume in all three of those, those, those particular industries. So I, I think there is a real complementary role. We'll always need uh, accountability organizations and I think they, they play very important roles uh, uh, but to uh, help celebrate the, the private sector innovation uh, and make heroes both of the, of the, they're not just small companies, some of them are very large companies too, uh, um, to celebrate those and to celebrate the uh, uh, government folks as well because we, we have risk averse culture and I think you have to talk about culture in this. Uh, you, have, you have to uh, celebrate uh, um, government employees who figure out how to redact PII or, or figure out how to make things more machine readable in an affordable way and, and have engaged with uh, stakeholders to figure out what, what they need. Because really that's what you want is this ecosystem, is how do you catalyze and accelerate that ecosystem. Okay, so let's, we've got an, um, an open data ecosystem in the U.S. that we're a good part of, you know, or at least the tip of the iceberg of around the table. What would be useful, we've got a half an hour, is to th be thinking about what are the elements of our ecosystem, what are the conditions, what are the uh, ways that uh, we need help in our open data movement that would advance, uh, you know, our open data culture and, you know, what, how might we employ, if that's the right word, uh, the Open Data Institute approach uh, in the U.S. and have us be part of this, this global network. Um, so, Joel, you're next. topic of incentives and whether we're talking about civic engagement and finding you know, an adequate incentive for citizens to engage with government or whether we're talking about finding adequate incentives for government to do things like opening data. Um, that I think is a really interesting part of where we're at as a movement 
that we've gone from, hey, wouldn't it be great if we open data to like thinking really specifically about the mechanisms for prompting people to do these kinds of you know, actions. One uh, suggestion to, to propose, um, especially you know, the work of ODI with corporations, uh, I started a project, it's just kind of a side project called datadonor.org. Um, and the idea was to kind of radically rethink uh, this concept of data as a kind of currency or you know, an exchangeable commodity. And I started thinking about the potential for doing, you know, considering data uh, for in-kind contributions and whether it would qualify for IRS um, charitable status and that whether that would be a mechanism for corporations to, you know, to think about the, the, ta the tax deduction that they could get from, you know, just basically giving a copy of data. It really wouldn't cost them much, but knowing that this, there is now an open marketplace that buys and sells this data, so there, there is a value attached to this stuff. Um, and that, I think, could be, at least in America, reading, you know, reading the tax code on, on charitable contributions. I think a case could be made that data should qualify, and that that might be a, an interesting incentive for corporations to open up data. Okay. Brett Goldstein. What many of us are being asked to do here is evaluate, is this a good idea in the U.S.? Um, is for those of you that know me, know that I have some exposure to this space. Um, I, I'm having trouble seeing what you're saying. The VC space in the U.S., and, and certainly in the Midwest, is very challenging. Um, if you go to the West Coast, they're very specific in, in what they want. And if you go to New York, they're also specific. So I, I'd ask you, because I'm, I'm always very wary about painting an overly optimistic picture. Um, but I, I, I'd like you to do so, because this could be a really good idea. Um, can, can you explain how sort of the lessons you're seeing with the VC community, which I assume are in the London area, are applicable here to what we're seeing, or if in fact these are already VCs that we have out here that would be showing interest, so I can ground it a bit. Uh, I, what I'm going to do is have a speak at the end, so I'm you know, so it's not just all uh, too dominated by by their uh, responses. So Stefan Verhulst is next. as I said yesterday, but I think um, the structure in order to allow for agility probably will have to be somewhat more of a hybrid than uh, uh, a structure that can serve all the functions and all the purposes that you set out to do. And so as I said yesterday, and I just reiterate that, it might be good to actually focus on the functions uh, as opposed to the kind of members uh, that you might have, and then think in terms of what are the functions that actually would benefit from having a networked approach. And here. What was interesting in your uh, overview of networks, uh, what I was missing somewhat was, for instance, um, networks or organizations uh, like uh, open source communities uh, that actually uh, have been very successful in uh, agile development uh, and legitimate development of certain kinds of solutions. And it might be interesting to see what are the lessons learned from actually those open source communities, whether they are Apache or even, for instance, here in uh, the US, uh, the, in, within the NHS, Direct, for instance, which was a whole uh, new way of going about actually providing for a, some kind of a common standard. I think those kinds of uh, lessons learned would be good. And, and there was, I think one of the core elements of that is that it was fundamental transparent and there was no barriers for entry. And so I'm a very concerned with actually the three the membership structure, which might actually create some kind of uh, uh, um, disincentives as, a, as opposed to incentives uh, to, to join. And then my last point that I want to make is that what would be interesting, uh, which I haven't seen uh, in, and I might have missed it in the current um, uh, thinking, is that what would be interesting would, would be to actually also bring different stakeholders who are currently not connected 
to the open data debate, which includes, for instance, consumers. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, and again, if you would have that three-pronged uh, um, membership, again, there is no place for consumers, uh, from my point of view, to actually be part, which I think would be beneficial, actually, to be part to bring them in actually a uh, conversation uh, that informs how data is used and also sees more and more the value proposition behind data. And I think that's an element that you may want to integrate. Good. Greg Allen. To your question of what are some of the problems or things that we, that we could use in the open data ecosystem, and I think that these have a little bit of, are skewed a bit towards um, data that is in government, but I think it's broader as well. Um, we are very challenged around agile infrastructure. If you want to do stuff with data, you have to be able to set up new infrastructure or deal with it, and that's obviously one of my interests in Git machines. Um, but the, um, we need a tool, we need some tools for anonymizing data, right? So if I have a big data set, how do I look at that for PII, and how do I anonymize that? Um, we need data, we need a framework for accepting added value to data set or cleaned up data sets back into government, right? We can publish government, but if an, if an NGO or a nonprofit cleans it up, what's the process for us bringing that back in? I think that there's some fabulous opportunities with what Max is doing with DAT for um, managing the transparency around uh, data provenance. Um, there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, I've always been very interested in synthetic data. We don't use it away. We don't use it enough. Generating synthetic data sets for purposes of modeling what we want to get out of data collections or policies or testing ideas out. Um, there's big opportunity there. Um, master identifiers for key items like schools or other entities. Um, you know, open corporate obviously taking that on on the corporations, but we there are more master identifier opportunities. And finally, PDF that um, opening up the data that is locked inside of PDFs once and for all, rather than skirting the issue. Um, and I think that that, is, that that is the possibility of a grand challenge that we'd like to explore further. Thank you. Ellen Miller. Uh, I'll, I'll Greg's, um, all of Greg's ideas. And I also That's like plus eight. That's great. Plus, eight, <laughs> plus one to each one. Um, and, and also, um, I wanted to mention, I thought Clay had a really good idea of the, one of the things that's missing is uh, real capacity to work with city governments and help them use tech, and, and there's a tremendous, tremendous finding there. So I think that's a great idea. But the conversation in the last 15, 20 minutes has sort of moved away from opening data to encouraging innovation. And my understanding that one of the reasons, and our own experiments in this field, that one of the, the reasons that there's lack of private interest in and uh, private interest in open data and therefore less innovation is because we're not seeing the data. So I sort of want to take the conversation back. Um, we're not seeing the data, you know, um, from the federal government. Um, you know, we've been asking for an audit of federal government data, how much is collected for five years now, and we finally got a promise that we would get that, but God knows when we'll get it. So we don't even know at the federal level what data is actually collected by government. So how in the world is business going to know that there is any um, particular business or innovation to be built on government data when we don't know where it, where it is, what it is, and it's certainly not, in, uh, not been released. We have, I think, three states out of 50 that have now passed open data policies. We are so much at the beginning of opening data. So I'd, I'd sort of like to take the question back, Charlie, to how can ODI help us just get the data out there? That, to me, without that, you, you have so what nothing. Would you, you, need? Have none, you have none of the other ambitious goals. What, what would you need from an organization like ODI that would advance that goal that you're advocating? What, what I'm how not, could I'm they? Sure how could they? The, I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I I'd, I'd like to hear ODI ju just focus on what I think of as sort of level one, like how do you get the data out of the UK government? How do we get the data out of the US government? How does Nigeria get the data out of the Nigerian government? If we think we have problems, there you know we're we're uh, you know are the problems and challenges that we face 
are nothing compared to the rest of the world, yeah. most of the rest but of so the world. But so what I'm trying to do, though, Ellen, in, on this point is I'm trying to go basically in a way to Stefan's point about the functions. What you're identifying a very important function, and I think we all would very much agree with that, certainly around this table, uh, by and large. And what are, you know, and kind of identify some needs in the U.S. for a network or an institution or, uh, you know, how, and the better we can identify those needs, I mean, we've, you've identified a, a goal and you're actually working on it yourself and doing, you know, great work at the Sunlight Foundation, but, um, you know, sure, we can ask them for, you know, how they, how they go about it, but uh, as we get our inputs, if we can identify what are the conditions and needs in the U.S. that we can, uh, where, that we can use a uh, institutional, where we can use institutional help, I think that would advance and the I, ball. I think the issue, Charlie, isn't where, is, I wouldn't approach it where we need institutional help, but what are the needs? Yeah. And then figure out the best. Right, right. Okay. Way uh, we're on to, the same wavelength. You know, that. to get them. John Bracken? Uh, th this might touch on institutional help a little bit too. I mean, so one of the tension points that I heard yesterday was around insiders and outsiders, and 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 JSB just referred to that. I, I thought I'm still digesting <laughs> JSB's comment, but how do we take the core of the corporation and face it outwards, and also take the outsiders and a ha accelerate that value internal to institutions? Um, and it made me think of two hallway conversations I had during that awesome 30-minute break we had. Um, one is, is there a way to do something like invert the Code for America Fellows model and instead of taking external change agents and accelerants like Max and Jessica and Michelle and focusing them in a government situation, is there a way to go into the government find the, the, the mid-level or other leaders who are the change agents, who are the ones facing the headwinds and the antibodies within their government, and to put a spotlight on them to accelerate their work, to, to accelerate their, net, their own networks and give them value adds within other like-minded folks within other parts of their local government or state government, Waldo, or, or, or nationally. The second one, which was I was eyeing across the room eager to see what Greg and Mark and Kathy were conspiring about, but a notion of a, a government enterprise zone, right, in which people could um, accelerate innovation in, in sort of a um, regulation, regulatory light type framework. Um, this in-out tension, I think, is just something that, that I, I'm seeing consistently come up again and again in lots of different conversations, not just about OpenGov, but I feel like OpenGov, government is the zone right now because of success of projects like Sunlight and Code for America, that the environment is best for, for the potential for some of these types of plays. Great. Uh, now let's hear from Code for America. Lord. city of Boston, there was a small little network of the change agents, and since I've been there, I think we've all sort of left after many years of banging our heads on the wall. Um, but I'm actually going to speak for GitHub, which is where I work now, um, and speaking, addressing the problems of the OpenGov community and open data and all of this, GitHub obviously realizes that GitHub is a great tool for governments or anyone who's storing information, sharing information, looking to collaborate with people. And um, we're currently building gov.github.com, which is what I'm working on with Ben Balter, who many of you know. And the idea of that is, and this is by no means like proposing that GitHub become the institution, but we're just realizing that there is a need for something in some sort of collection of this information. Um, and so we're building the site to, one, try and get a good sense of the community, right? Because when you log on to GitHub or you sign up for an account, there's no checkbox that says, I'm a government entity or I'm a nonprofit that only builds civic apps. Um, and that's unfortunate <laughs> right now because we're building it from our head and from like searching our API and trying to find um, these groups manually, but no one else has really found that manually. and so. We're trying to build a collective list of who are the governments 
internationally, in America, city, state, county, all of that, of who's using GitHub to show to the people that haven't joined GitHub yet and have thought about it or have heard about it and don't know exactly how many other people are using it or what they're actually putting on GitHub, how they're using it. And so the site will hopefully get a good active list of the, uh, the actual community on GitHub right now, but then also try to hold hands to people who haven't joined GitHub and walk them through the flow of how it can be useful to them and how easy joining is and how it's a matter of creating an account and uploading a CSV and then you have opened data. Like skipping the whole talking about standards and all those things are great, but really, it's really easy to make that first step. Sign up for an account and upload a CSV. Let someone else clean it and submit a pull request and then you get it back. And so, anyways, I just wanted to highlight that. And if you don't think that we know that you're on GitHub, please tell. <laughs> okay. Alyssa Black, New America. And then I'm going to turn to our Open Data Institute guys and finish up with Nick Sonner. So I wanted to touch on um, John's comments on creating more rock stars in government. Um, I am challenged with that every day. I'm trying to think about how we can make these innovations in the city within government. One of them is to create more rock stars. Um, but I, I wanted to get back to one way that maybe ODI can help in this area, and I think it's articulating the position. Max mentioned this around telling the human stories, and I think that's really important when I have conversations with local governments in California. It's usually around why does this matter to me and how do I sell it to my supervisors or my managers. And so I think that's an area where a network can really be beneficial because you can get different stories told from different players, which I think is the, the kind of picture that we want to paint is is a diverse picture of, of the value to different actors, whether it's business, other government staffers, um, environmentalists, NGOs, um, that whole work. And then, John, one, um, you mentioned enterprise zones. Um, San Francisco has innovation zones that they're prototyping right now, which allows for um, different companies to kind of have this very fast model of prototyping and piloting their technologies, design, different types of features within certain spaces in, in San Francisco. So it's maybe a model to look at when you think about innovation zones. I just want to say, I, I threw this on the, on the Twitter stream, but Joey Ito, who now is one of my bosses as a board member of the organization, in 2009 wrote a blog post thinking about agile development, lessons from agile development for government. Um, um, so anyway, if you look at it on the hashtag, it's, it's, it's interesting to read it now and think about some of those types of experiments because it's very much tied to it f from four years ago. Good. Well, pulling a full, few things together, finishing up with, you know, with the, the starting point, which is articulating what it is, what is the value proposition, which you finished with, but also I think uh, JSB came in with sort of the broader, you know, societal and uh, institutional uh, articulation, but uh, we've been for two days been articulating the importance and need for uh, open uh, data as part of open governance um, and, and how we can encourage both inside and outside of government, the, the apps, the groups, the movements, um, the people uh, and the people inside that that was a very interesting uh, idea of, of even highlighting uh, you know, people inside the government and giving them new opportunities. Uh, the value of the network in fostering that. Uh, addressing the VCs and the, you know, the, the issue of proprietary versus open data and how, uh, how that will affect the ability of um, people to get funded and, uh, you, know, you know, again, a, a statement of value proposition and how you can uh, encourage uh, investment for innovation. Um, the importance of citizens, not just the builders and not just the, you know, the edge dwellers or the edge builders or the uh, players, uh, but the average citizens in remembering that that's what this is all about. Um, this is who we're trying to do it for uh, and how it's going to impact them. And uh, importantly, uh, especially for, I think, our group, uh, is the United States is so complex. It's large, it's federal, it's, you know, you got federal, state, local, you've got, even within a jurisdiction, you have competing organizations. We don't have sort of that uh, parliamentary sense 
uh, from the top, uh, you know, kind of anywhere, and we're contentious. And not only that, uh, and very multifaceted. So um, the interrelationships, but the, you know, the importance of the network form and the opportunities that networks gives uh, this kind of uh, uh, society, uh, I think has, has great potential. So with that said, uh, we, we've asked you a lot of questions mm. and uh, just thought we would get your reaction. Thank you. So, okay, um, we'll both have a go at this. I think I, I would just say um, very eloquently put, Charlie, as well. I mean, that's summarization. I think fears, um, it's pretty contentious and ornery in, in the UK as well. There are actually four devolved administrations, Scotland, Wales, <laughs> and uh, uh, there are 360 local councils who uh, think that they do not take their orders from the top. So, but but, but uh, there are very, very uh, um, striking and, and distinct um, um, differences between our geographies, and, and, and we absolutely have to understand and, and, and respect that. So just looking, again, I, I don't think we've got all the answers. I mean, in the, in the presentation we gave, we could only really touch on some of the um, things we've been doing, and, and we'd be very delighted to talk about some of our examples. I think this extremely powerful idea of narratives and stories that are compelling, humanly compelling, it, we've set ourselves an agenda actually of generating something we can get national press interest in about once every three months. And, uh, and some of these won't translate because one of them, our first one, related to the national health system. You know, it's, uh, we, have a, we have a countrywide release of data. All GPs release every prescription they write out every month. Um, not to who, but what the drug was. And that's a really powerful data set. In fact, the pharmaceuticals thinks it's a really powerful data set as well, of course, now. Uh, but it's open. And we can do the analytics that everybody understands that 200 million identified for generics versus um, non-generics for one class of drug is, is, is actually a story everybody can understand. So we need that kind of range of, 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 of depth and impact. Um, and, and we also actually, um, with one of the G8, uh, um, uh, if you can believe the, um, the actual commitment, that, well, the commitment is there to actually set up a task force to look at impact of, of open data programs. So I think this whole issue of impact and understanding what impact is and how it counts is, is hugely important. What we have observed, though, is that actually our, our plan is not to go for one kind of money. And I guess because we are looking at both um, corporate, the public and um, private, corporate and public worlds, we, are, we, we see our funding actually as a mix of public funding, um, uh, philanthropic funding in part, VC funding in part. I mean, we, we, that, we don't think that we will necessarily um, uh, get it all from one particular source. We do absolutely believe that unless we um, can convince our government that um, we can stimulate demand that isn't just civic demand, that there is economic, commercial demand for open data, they won't take the hard decisions to supply the data to the style and quality and sustainability that's required. Uh, and I really do think it's an existential threat to any government to keep on producing this stuff if it's not actually uh, um, uh, appearing as a value such that when it's switched off or goes missing for a month, businesses are screaming for it and saying, well, where's, where's it gone? Um, I think there are... What we've also observed is that with the Open Data Institute, but the thing that really captures the imagination is this open innovation model that involves standards, licenses, participation, all of which are uh, and open data. Um, and I think that, absolutely, I think we have got to keep our, our it's important that we succeed because that's one of the ways we'll convince government to keep releasing this stuff because it's by no means a one battle. And indeed, <coughs> releasing data that matters um, um, is an ongoing uh, battle on a daily basis, and we don't win them all uh, anything like. And we just enumerating the data sets that should be released and could be released, and then ensuring they're not sold off at some appropriate moment um, is, is actually a, a challenge for us. Um, and just a couple of other points. Um, the challenges around master identifiers, I think one thing that we have absolutely seen is that, or URIs, you know, uh, web dereferenceable stable identifiers for your schools, your roads, your companies, the contracts you place, an absolutely new kind of essential national data infrastructure that uh, we've just begun to think about uh, uh, building. I mean, of course, in particular sectors, these have existed. Often they've got proprietary interests around them. But you know, these as public goods turn out to be extremely powerful. Um, 
I think we'd all cheer at PreVFs. Um, but the tooling challenge around what we do to make uh, an environment that's easy to consume and produce this stuff, and the kind of work that Max is doing and others, really important. And I think, again, we want to, want to be part of that, of that space of standards and tooling. Um, and I guess the other thing to say is, again, I, we're an open data institute, but we live in a mixed data ecosystem. So one of the things that's been really important to us is to understand how we have conversations to people whose principal interest is personal information assets. It's actually personal, it's identifiable, it has huge potential value, current value, um, and how do we work out how open data adds value to that, and, uh, um, and how do we actually work out to keep the definitional understanding very clear that when we talk about this, we don't mean we're gonna make your personal data open. Uh, and we get into all sorts of moral panics in that area when, when government talks about sharing and linking data it holds about citizens across. And the point about consumers, um, it, it essential to a, a engage them in this conversation. So that data ecosystem is one in which I think there needs to be a, a really strong conversation, which is lots of people building around the edges of innovation in this space that I think it makes it so, so interesting. And I, you know, reminded, um, the, uh, the, the uh, of, often used as a totemic example, but Andraka, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Maryland student, 15-year-old, who produces a 50, a five cent or something, you know, paper-based cancer sensor, um, having slaved through thousands of online papers and paid the subscription rates to get them. And his, his simple plea is, make the data open so that more people can innovate in this space and we can do remarkable things. I mean, there are just so many opportunities here. So I think we can imagine a structure in which ODI is supporting a range, uh, a, a broad range of data types and a broad range of data values. And um, what I think uh, uh, I've heard today is, is a real appetite to kind of share insights and learning there. And we don't believe we've got the right network structure at this point, but we have got a very stable set of, I think, no, stable. We've got an emerging set of principles that I think we'd like to share with you, and perhaps Gavin could take over that point. Just like that. Thank, thanks, Nigel. Yeah. So I just want to come back to the next point about we need to capacity build as we open the information, and we're just at the seams. And I strongly believe that. And I think one of the values that we've discovered is that having multiple sources of funding, public sector, private sector, and philanthropic investment, enables us to focus on solving problems. And I joined the ODI to try and solve problems. I'm sure most of the people around this table are here to try and solve problems. I don't really care where the people are sitting at the moment in time they solve them, whether they're in the public sector, the private sector, a startup, and so on. But if we can connect those people together and give them the en enough backing, whether that's moral backing or financial backing, to make the difference and make it in a sustainable way, then we will have achieved significant impact. So. I like the idea that um, John mentioned on the enabling uh, a government enterprise zone, regulation light data intensive, I think is a very powerful way for government to engage with enabling failure, actually, uh, creating a space, right space for innovation. In terms of um, getting the data out there, well, we need to tell the stories. Uh, and th this is a common thing that comes back in almost every conversation I have. Global momentum from global stories that help us drive standards adoption, that help us demonstrate what the value is to that individual, not necessarily to their boss, but to the individual so they can work out how to communicate it to their peers. Articulating this value proposition to me and how I sell it to my peers is, is, is critical here. So I think really bringing these different threads together, we'd love to see lessons learned contribute. I've put up on the screen behind me a page on GitHub, which is what we, we've defined as the initial set of services that an ODI might offer. But again, to Stefan's point, we need to be dynamic around that. We need to be able to say, well, this is completely inapplicable in this territory or for this purpose. But we can use the tools that we've built over the last 20 years on the web to do this. So we have the technologies. It's really making sure that we use them to refactor how organizations work. And I'd like to thank John again for his elephant summary. So, uh, Nick, I've seen around the table a, an appetite for the kinds of services and ideas and support that ODI offers. Um, we have a lot of uh, potential. <laughs> we have a lot of needs in the United States and a lot of potential. I just thought you had some last thoughts about 
where we might go or how we might go would be appreciated. Continue our, our our open data journey in the, in the federal government. I think we've we've done fantastic things in the last couple of years, and I think I think we're we're only just getting started here. So I think there there is opportunity for all of you to plug in individually and with your organizations, but there's also opportunity for for a nonprofit uh, to plug in 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 various vertical areas uh, where where we're continuing to build build the ecosystem, and so plus one to all of Greg's uh, specific. Uh, 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 things around around mosaic effect, ingesting data, and uh, unique identifiers, and PDFs and standards. Plus one to, to Nigel's comments about about my data, which ties into this notion of of, of being able to get uh, uh, customized or personalized information that the government has about you uh, in a, in a single place or in a federated manner, but but from multiple places. Uh, um, to to Ellen's comments about the, the private sector interest, I want to make sure that we distinguish between uh, private sector interest in open data business models and uh, versus the private sector interest in open government data. Because there's tremendous interest in our data from all kinds of uh, uh, corporations, large and small, uh, that, that every day uh, complain to us when we don't make the data right when we when our API fails, et cetera, and so it's it's uh, helping helping us with that demand, and, a, and I think a nonprofit can help channel that demand as part of these vertical things. So just very very practically, uh, a huge plus one to John Bracken's uh, uh, focusing on rock stars in government. There's a lot of fantastic innovators uh, in government, and finding ways to support them and celebrate them and the impact that they have as they open data and work. Uh, 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 externally as well to, to, to use that data to solve problems. Uh, um, and then, you know, we're going we're gonna to have uh, a variety of meetups and data jams and workshops and larger celebration events, which are opportunities, of course, uh, uh, to launch prizes and, and competitions, but also to, to uh, celebrate opening government data. And there's opportunity for all of you to plug into those individually in organizations, but again, uh, there is an opportunity here for for uh, uh, help uh, and a, a independent nonprofit that that very practically wants to wants to help in it in in one or multiple multiple of those of those areas is uh, I think that there there really is a, a need there at least in the provincial area of, of opening uh, federal government data which is is massive when you think about fiscal and budget and regulations and geo data and personal data back back just to the, the, the people that it is. So um, I'm really excited about where this conversation has gone and, and hopeful that there's, there's opportunities to, to move it forward. Okay, terrific. So uh, I've seen the need. Uh, maybe out of this, we'll, uh, maybe there'll be a new entity. Maybe somebody will step up and sort of take on that, that role. And certainly it, we've got the, the basis for you know, an internal U.S. network that would be connected in with the uh, global ODI network. Um, this afternoon, we're going to break into our working groups again and refine our, uh, our areas of um, specific uh, innovation in serving citizens and engaging citizens and using data for uh, social benefit. Uh, just a reminder that we meet at 6 p.m., at the meadows for uh, uh, the, the vans that are going to take us up to the Pine Creek Cookhouse, which is out about a half an hour out into the country. It's a beautiful, we leave early so we can get there for the sunset. Uh, so it's a beautiful evening. Please tell Trisha if you're not going to be uh, joining us so we can adjust. I also see Dennis Scholl in the back of the room, and he has been uh, uh, a reminder if uh, you are scheduled to do a video with Venice. Uh, to, with Dennis, uh, please, uh, you know, respect, please uh, be on time. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think uh, it's a very productive morning. Uh, let's break for lunch and reconvene at our working groups at 2 p.m. Thanks. <laughs>